subject I want to talk about is the causes and consequences of the Ukraine crisis, which of course has been in the news in a really big way since uh, February 2014. And indeed, there was a big story uh, on the civil war in eastern Ukraine in the newspapers this morning. Uh, the outline I'd like to follow is, I'd just like to make a number of preliminary comments to give you some background on this crisis. Then I'd like to give you my thinking on what caused the crisis. Uh, then tell you why I think the conventional wisdom is wrong. Talk a little bit about the West's response so far to the crisis, which is just, in my opinion, making a bad situation worse. And tell you what I think should be done. And then finally wrap up with some discussion of the consequences. Uh, so let me start with some preliminary comments. First, with regard to America's core strategic interests. For me, core strategic interests are areas of the world where you're willing to fight and die. Uh, and in my opinion, outside of the Western Hemisphere, which is of enormous strategic importance to us, there are only three areas of the world that really matter. One is Europe, two is Northeast Asia, and three is the Persian Gulf. And it's very important to understand that since this country got its independence in 1783, Europe has been the most important area of the world. Uh, even though the Japanese attacked us at Pearl Harbor, we had a Europe first policy going into the war and we had a Europe first policy throughout the war. And it's in large part because the great powers in Europe are more important than the great powers in Northeast Asia over time. And of course, the Persian Gulf was an important area because that's where the oil is and oil is a critical resource that matters greatly um, in the international system. So those are the three most important areas outside the Western Hemisphere. And again, since the beginning of this country, Europe has been number one. You want to understand that we're undergoing a fundamental shift, a shift of great importance. Asia, because of the rise of China, is going to be the most important area of the world for the United States. The Persian Gulf, because it's inextricably linked with Asia, oil flowing to India, oil flowing to China, the Persian Gulf will be number two, and Europe will be a distant three. We're basically leaving Europe in the rearview mirror. Uh, and of course, you want to keep this in mind because the Ukraine crisis is in Europe and it involves NATO. Just how to think about the geography of Europe. This is a simple, if not simplistic, way of thinking about it. But here's a map. Uh, you can see where Ukraine is. You can see where Poland is. You can see where Russia is. The way I think about European security is there's France, Germany, Poland, Ukraine, and Russia. Of course, we're moving from west to east. These are the big kahunes. These are the big countries that matter. And of course, the two countries that matter the most historically are Germany and Russia, or for most of the 20th century, Germany and the Soviet Union. And I put them in red because as you well know, both Germany and the Soviet Union fought bitter wars in Poland, in Ukraine, and we could add in Belarus as well, if need be. But as we go along here, you want to keep in mind that Ukraine is right next to Russia, and Poland is right next to Ukraine. And then out further west is Germany and France. Take this a step further. This is the ethnic breakdown of Ukraine. I'm going to show you a number of maps, all of which are designed to show you that Ukraine is a badly divided country. And what's taking place inside Ukraine today is in good part a civil war. And it, to that extent, it doesn't have that much to do with what the Russians or the West uh, are doing there. Uh, and as you can see in red uh, are mostly Ukrainian speaking people. And then as you move further east, you're talking about uh, lots of Russians and certainly lots of Russian speakers. Uh, this is the Ukraine election of 2004. This is the election in the wake of the famous Orange Revolution, which I'll talk more about. Uh, as you can see, the country is badly divided uh, between the East and the West. The Russian speakers in the East and the Ukrainian speakers in the West. 
This is the 2010 election, which resulted in Yanukovych getting elected. I'll talk about President Yanukovych as we go along. He was elected in 2010. And you can see there uh, the voting patterns in the 2010 election look a lot like the voting patterns in the 2004 election. And then these are two recent surveys that came out um, from the International Republican Institute that's here in the United States. Uh, this one says, if Ukraine could enter only one international economic union, which of the following should it be? And of course, the blue is the EU, uh, and the light blue uh, is the customs union, or actually the red is the customs union of Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. Um, and the cities up at the top are in western Ukraine, and the cities down on the bottom are in eastern Ukraine. So you can see very clearly that people in the west would like to join the EU. People in the east have little interest in joining the EU. Those are the EU numbers. Here are the NATO numbers. I mean, these two charts look virtually the same. But all of this tells you that you have a badly divided country. And the conflict between the West and Russia over Ukraine is played out in the context of this situation. This is a simple little view graph that shows Europe's dependent on Russian gas. It's quite clear from that view graph that many of the countries in Eastern Europe uh, and even countries like Germany are heavily dependent on Russian natural gas. And of course, that gives the Russians lots of political leverage in this crisis, and it makes it very difficult for us uh, to put pressure on the Russians. OK, those are just a number of preliminary comments I wanted to throw out just to set this up. Let's talk about the causes of the conflict. I think if you're going to talk about the causes of the conflict, you have to come at it from three different perspectives. First of all, you have to ask, what are the deep causes of the crisis? What are the structural factors that underpin this conflict? Then you have to talk about the precipitating causes, because the crisis broke out on February 22, 2014. Things were not terrible until February 22, 2014. And that's when everything went to hell in a handbasket. And the question is, what caused it then? If you focus on deep causes, it can't tell you why something happened in February 2014, but the precipitating causes are designed to get at that. And then what we want to talk about is the Russian reaction, why the Russians did what they did with regard to Crimea, with regard to eastern Ukraine. We want to talk about exactly what they did and then why they did it. So let's start with the deep causes. My argument is that the West is principally responsible for this mess, not the Russians. Uh, this, of course, is not the conventional wisdom in the United States. And in fact, except for Steve Cohen, who's now at Princeton, I mean now at NYU, he used to be at Princeton, Henry Kissinger, and maybe a handful of other people, uh, there are not many people who agree with me. But uh, I, I think the facts are quite clear on this, that the West is responsible. And my aim is that the main deep causes, the aim of the United States and its European allies to peel Ukraine away from Russia's orbit and incorporate it into the West. Our basic goal has been to make Ukraine a Western bulwark on Russia's border. And Russia says, this ain't happening, period, end of story. And we will do everything we can to make sure it does not happen. That's the deep cause. Now, take it a step further. There are three key elements in our strategy. The first is NATO expansion, and in many ways the most important. And I'll talk in some detail about that in a second. But as you all know, since the Cold War ended, starting with the Clinton administration, we have been moving NATO eastward toward Russia's border. And the Russians have said, this is an absolute no-no. And I'll walk you through the story in a minute. Second is EU expansion. EU expansion is all about integrating Ukraine economically into the West, the way we are in the process of integrating Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, the Baltic states into 
the West. And of course, we're doing that with NATO as well. These are two sets of institutions, NATO, military institution, the EU, an economic institution. And the idea, again, is to take Ukraine, peel it away from Russia, and make it part of the West. The third part of the story is fostering an orange revolution. This is all about promoting democracy in Ukraine and in other places. As you all know, the United States runs around the world trying to topple regimes and put in their place democratically elected regimes. And for almost all of you, me included, it's hard to be against promoting democracy. We all love democracy. But if you're Vladimir Putin, uh, or if you're part of the leadership in Beijing, when the United States talks about democracy promotion, that means toppling your regime. And you won't be surprised to hear this. They don't like that in Beijing, and they don't like that in Moscow. Right? They do not like that. Right? The Chinese believe that we're behind the protests in Hong Kong. You go to Beijing, and you talk to Chinese elites. The idea that we're promoting democracy around the world, and especially in East Asia, just drives them crazy. Because they think they're in the crosshairs. And you know what? They are in the crosshairs because our basic strategy is to topple regimes all over the world. Not simply because we like democracy, but because we believe that whoever gets elected will be pro-Western. So we're killing two birds with one stone. We're promoting democracy and getting leaders who are pro-American. But again, you can see the strategy here, NATO expansion, EU expansion, and promoting democracy. Say a bit more about NATO expansion because it's so important. Uh, NATO expansion took uh, place in two tranches. The first one was in 1999. That's when you get Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary incorporated into NATO. The second big tranche was in 2004. And that's when the Baltic states, you can see Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania up top, Romania, Bulgaria, these are the light brown countries. That's the second tranche of NATO expansion. Now, the Soviets made it clear from the mid-1990s they were adamantly opposed to NATO expansion. But number one, they were too weak to do anything about it. And two, it didn't involve the states that were right on their border. I mean. There's no question, as you can see from the map, that Latvia and Estonia are on Russia's border, and Lithuania uh, as well, if you want to include that little enclave between Poland and Lithuania. But, but the fact is, these were very small states. It was early in the game, and the Russians were willing to live with it. But then the big trouble starts, and it comes in the famous Bucharest summit, uh, NATO's Bucharest summer, in summit in April 2008, where at the end of the summit, uh, a declaration is issued which says, NATO welcomes Ukraine's and Georgia's Euro-Atlantic aspirations for membership in NATO. We agreed today that these countries will become members of NATO. The Soviet, excuse me, the Soviets, the Russians made this perfectly clear. This was unacceptable. Russia's deputy foreign minister said, Georgia's and Ukraine's membership in the alliance is a huge strategic mistake, which will have most serious consequences for pan-European security. Putin himself said, Georgia and Ukraine becoming part of NATO is a direct threat to Russia. You all remember that there was a war between Russia and Georgia in August 2008. That war was a consequence of this, because the Georgians thought we were sending them a signal that they could get uppity with the Russians and we would back them because they were going to become part of NATO. That's not what happened. And you know what happened. The Russians clobbered the Georgians, and Georgia is in deep trouble today because it thought it, be it could become part of NATO. So you want to remember that April 2008 summit, very important. That declaration, very important. And then what happens is you have a war. 
So those are the deep causes, those three strategies. NATO expansion, EU expansion, and promoting democracy. What about the precipitating cause? The key events leading up to the coup. It's the coup of February 22nd, 2014 that's of enormous importance. That's what really throws the crisis into gear. Just think about that word, coup. Orange Revolution, promoting democracy, the coup, February 22nd, 2014. So the question is, what causes the coup? It all starts in November of 2013. At that point, Yanukovych, President Yanukovych, who's the head of Ukraine, is negotiating with, e, with the EU to form an association agreement that brings the EU and Ukraine much closer together. It's a step in the direction of incorporating Ukraine into the European Union, or to put it in slightly different terms, incorporating Ukraine into the West. The Russians make it clear that this is unacceptable. The Russians are willing to do a deal that involves the EU, Russia, the IMF, and Ukraine. But the idea that Ukraine is going to do a deal exclusively with the EU and the Russians are going to be left out in the cold is not something that Putin is willing to countenance. He puts significant pressure on the Ukrainians. He offers them a terrific deal. And as you can imagine, the EU is not offering Ukraine a particularly good deal because you know how much corruption there is in Ukraine. And the EU wants Ukraine to eliminate that corruption which the Ukrainians really don't want to do. So what Putin does is not only make it clear that that deal is not going to happen, but he often offers a sweetheart deal of his own. So Yanukovych on November 21st says no to the EU. This leads to a series of protests. The Ukrainian government, truth be told, uh, under Yanukovych overreacts to the protests, which causes them to spiral out of control. And in January of 2014, you can see there, January 22nd, 2014, you have your first two deaths in the protests. These are the Maidan protests. And then in the February 18th through February 20th time period, lots of people die. It's really messy. And what happens is that a number of European foreign ministers, the German foreign minister, French foreign minister, they fly to Kiev and a deal is worked out uh, to have elections that will, in effect, remove Yanukovych from power. Um, but the protesters refuse to accept the deal. And there are significant fascist elements among the protesters who are armed, right? There's killing on the Maidan. And as a result, Yanukovych flees for his life to Russia. And this all happens on February 22nd. And, oh, did I not have that slide on? I'm sorry. <laughs> One of the problems with this lectern is you can't see. I'm sorry, there is, that's the slide that has all the key events. <laughs> oh, gosh, sorry. I have two slides up here, so I, lost track of the fact. So here are the key events after the coup. On February 23rd, Parliament votes to repeal minority language laws in the East. This is basically the Russian language. Uh, and then on February 27th, Russian units begin seizing checkpoints in the Crimea. On the 28th, additional Russian forces begin moving into the Crimea. The Russians didn't conquer or invade Crimea. Excuse me, the Russians didn't invade Crimea. They were already there because they had a leasing agreement. There's a naval base at Sevastopol, and the Russians were leasing that naval base from Ukraine. So they had military forces there. So when it says Russian units begin seizing checkpoints on the 27th, those were Russian units that were already there. Then additional Russian forces begin moving in on the 28th. And then on the 6th, the 16th, and the 18th, you have a scenario, you have a, a, a handful of events that lead to Russia incorporating Crimea. And then, of course, shortly after that, 
conflict breaks out in eastern Ukraine, and although we do not have a lot of hard evidence that the Russians are physically involved in eastern Ukraine, I think it's quite clear that they are physically involved, that there are Russian troops there. How many is very hard to tell from the outside. Uh, and um, I think it's very clear that the Russian government is going to great lengths to make sure that those pro-Russian forces in eastern Ukraine are interest, are, are capable uh, of uh, maintaining uh, a certain amount of independence, and I'll talk more about this in a second. Okay, understanding the Russian response. What is the Russian response? Two parts. First is they took Crimea and they're not giving it back. Crimea is gone. Second is what they're doing is not trying to conquer Ukraine. There are many people who say the Russians are going to go on a rampage, they're going to try and reestablish the Soviet Union or a greater Russia, uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, Putin is much too smart for that. You remember what happened when the Russians invaded Afghanistan? You remember what happened when we invaded Afghanistan? You remember what happened when we invaded, invaded Iraq? You remember what happened when the Israelis invaded southern Lebanon? You want to stay out of these places. In fact, if you really want to wreck Russia, what you should do is encourage it to try and conquer Ukraine. Putin, again, is much too smart to do that. What Putin is doing is he's basically in the process of wrecking Ukraine, and he's telling the West in very simple terms, you have two choices. You either back off, right, and we go back to the status quo ante before February 22, 2014, where Ukraine is a buffer state, or you continue to play these games where you try and take Ukraine and make it a Western bastion on our doorstep, in which case we'll wreck the country. And they are, of course, now in the process of wrecking it. Right? And they're going to keep this conflict going for as long as they have to. Uh, 